Okay, chapter three, the First World War. Again, we're in the book, The History of the 20th Century. You guys, this may seem like it's going a little bit slow, but I'm telling you, it takes a lot, lot longer to read this book. I really guarantee you. Here's one of the big takeaways is we're going to be looking at the First World War, World War One, which was this. Basically, for the most part, military forces could defend successfully. The problem was if you wanted to go on the offensive. Very rarely, as you read all these battles and stuff, very rarely did it seem like there was a lot of success for the military forces that were on the offensive that were trying to take new ground. Basically, as trench warfare, people got on their side and us on our side, and there was this, you know, no man's land in between, and people pretty much just, I mean, maybe you fought and you could gain a little bit of ground, like a mile or something, but for the most part, it just, it was very different from, say, the Second, second War in that sense. So, here we go. Let's start off. So basically, the Germans, they push towards Paris, but they're stopped 30 miles short of Paris by French and British forces. Now, the Russians were fighting against the Germans as well and invaded Prussia. But, I mean, the Russians were also frustrated in their attempts. Austro-Hungarian forces hoped for a quick defeat of the Serbs, but it did not happen. And the Austrians were unable to secure a victory. Basically, high death tolls in the beginning. Lots of war widows, lots of war orphans, lots of grieving. No man's land. Christmas Day. 21 separate incidences are, are recorded of soldiers from each side meeting in the middle and hanging out, playing soccer, football, whatever, uh, taking photos, greeting each other, just, you know, talking. And it was, I mean, quite strange, but 21 different incidences. Basically trench warfare, like I said. I mean, just people locked down, build these intricate systems of trenches, and, I mean, it does get brutal, a lot of amputations, a lot of gangrene, infection, awful living conditions, right? <clears throat> but um, on the Eastern Front, the Germans steadily reversed their initial defeats and advanced into Russian Poland. In the Southern sector, it was the Russians who advanced pushing back their Austrian adversary. The Central Powers, it was the Germans uh, and Austria-Hungary and Turkey who were all teamed together under the Central Powers. Eventually, also, the Bulgarians joined their team. So, Central Powers, the Germans, Austria-Hungary, the Turks, and the Bulgarians. The Allied Powers, on the other hand, is the British, the French, the Belgians, um, the Serbs, and also the Russians, because the Russians were trying to protect uh, Serbia. Eventually, Japan and the U.S., and Italy will also join the Allied Powers. So the Allied Powers really had a lot numerically in terms of countries that were on their side. So early in the war, the Austrians suggested to Germany to make peace with the Russians, but Germany refused, believing it could capture more victory and even more land from Russia. So a lot of the times in the First and the Second World War, I mean, the leaders that are always thinking about the end game, right? You know, how is this going to play out? What are we going to be able to take? What lands are we going to maybe be able to take back from that pissed off time that we lost them before, two decades before, whatever, three decades ago, that we haven't forgotten about, we're still bitter about? You know, can we get those? Can we get some, say, lands that have like good ports, good seaways, good waterways, um, maybe oil lands? You know, what, what is the, the upside of this, all this fighting? So the economics of it was always one thing to think about. Anyway, on the Western Front, um, the British make their first military initiative of 1915, which was to push the Germans out of the French area called Nouvelle Chapelle. I don't know, but it didn't, it didn't work. Like I said, it's very difficult to uproot people in this war. Uh, in a single day, as the British were shelling the D German defenses, they fired more shells than during the whole of the Boer Wars in South Africa. So you guys remember just a decade earlier, they were fighting in South Africa, the Boer Wars. Well, in one day, one day, could you imagine? shooting off more uh, mortar shells than an entire war. In one sector, the British did not hit the German forces. So taking advantage, the Germans did a counterattack, right? They go on the offensive, but it failed. So gas attacks begin. And this is kind of one of the other awful things. Chlorine gas attacks begin. There's a big battle before the Dardanelles, which had access uh, to the river Danube as, quote, a line of communication for an army penetrating into the heart of Austria. Uh, also, 
it brings the British sea power to bear in the middle of Europe. So the British had a, a good fleet, a good navy. So the first attack was to be ships only, and the plan was supported by the first Lord um, Chir uh, Winston Churchill. So basically, Churchill, this is he's a young man. He's in charge of the navy at this point, and I mean, it basically, he suffers like the worst, worst of the worst defeats, um, and he's haunted by it for the rest of his life. <clears throat> Doesn't really redeem himself until World War II, but anyways, I'm jumping ahead. So basically, uh, in this event, they send in a bunch of ships to clear all the mines that were in the harbors that they knew about. But, I mean, those efforts, they did pretty good. They did miss a few mines. And so when the Brits sent in their 10 ships, their 10 big destroyers or whatever, their warships, um, three of them hit landmines and they're sunk. And so the whole attack was called off and they go back with their seven remaining ships and they regroup and, you know, the leaders are like, come on, let's do it again. You know, we could, we could make sure we could do a better job, sweep all the mines. And, you know, I mean, we can still be successful. This is a huge, huge thing. And you know, whatever. They, they said no. They said no. The war office was like, no, that didn't work. We're not, you know, we're not doing that again. So they sent in troops. And I mean, basically they would land in uh, Gallipoli and destroy the defenses that were facing the waterway. And then the ships would be sent in a second time. Um, but it says the Turkish troops prevailed. Um, and it's just, it just was not good. So uh, the next day, the Allied powers accepted Italy into their group under the conditions that Italy would be given a certain amount of land in Austria once it was finished. Italy, Italy would fight in the mountains, and uh, the British and the French would fight Turkey on the Gallipoli Peninsula and on the Western Front. So that was the agreement. So in the eastern region of Turkey, there was a large Armenian Christian population, long denied its nation, uh, national rights by the, the Turks who were Muslim. And they hoped that a Russian victory over Turkey would result in a, a nation for them, you know, a nation place or a nationhood for Armenia. Uh, this result or this hope resulted in the killing of many Armenians by the Turks, and they were forced to flee into the deserts of Syria. <clears throat> the other thing that happened was that there was a German submarine that sunk a passenger vessel where about 2,000 people died. And, you know, before this, um, and it looks like apparently still even up to this, this point, Woodrow Wilson in America is really committed to neutra neutrality. Um, so the British keep fighting for this same city of uh, Nueva Chapelle, but a second time, you know, their efforts to take it fail, cost a large sum, both in terms of men and in terms of, uh, you know, resources. So the other thing, women, they go into the ammunition factories um, the British seem quite unorganized and continue to make serious errors of communication, costing many lives. Uh, the, British, the British retreat uh, from a region um, cost them about nine months, 50,000 deaths for the Allies at that point, with about 66,000 deaths for the Turks. So, I mean, people are dying. It's, you know, kind of even, I guess. Maybe you could say one side is doing a little bit better. But Russia is losing. Um, they asked for help from the British. Now the British start using poison gas and the British uh, walk their troops right into German machine gun fire. So again, that's one of the examples of just their disorganization, their bad planning. You know, why would you do that? There's riots in Russia and um, it was basically by people that were um, being forced to serve a second tour. So people that had already maybe shell shot PTSD, they had already seen the horrors of war, they didn't want to go back. Maybe they didn't see any upside. Maybe the pay was bad. Maybe the conditions were bad. Maybe it was just disorganized. Maybe they didn't believe in the war, whatever. But they didn't want to go back. You know, They didn't want to be forced to serve a second term. And so they were starting to riot in Russia. Um, Russia just couldn't summon enough troops, basically. Uh, Lenin is excited about the riots as he writes from Switzerland, right? You got to remember, he's still in Switzerland. He's in exile. He's thinking, you know, we're going to see the end of this, these czars. We're going to, you know, we're going to see the bringing of, of communism, some changes, the, you know, the proletariat, the freedom of the workers and all that. A second front by the British against the Turk occurs in Basra and in Baghdad, so in Iraq. And the conditions were very hot, but the results were better uh, than those had by the British in Gallipoli. Gallipoli. So, okay. They had a, a victory. That's fine. Uh, there were Arabs who would steal and mutilate some of the wounded soldiers, uh, but Baghdad was unconquered. 
the Hungarians were able to take uh, the Serbian capital of Belgrade. Oh yes, sorry I misspoke before. Sarajevo is the was the capital of Yugoslavia. Uh, seeing this, Bulgaria enters the war and becomes part of the Central Powers. So the French were committed 100% to protecting Verdun, which means they would always need to keep ships and extra troops there as long as there was just the smallest threat maintained by the Central Powers. Now the Central Powers knew this, so they just they maintained a very minimal threat and were able to basically occupy all those resources that the French had. And so uh, Germans sweep through Poli Poland and Lithuania and uh, provinces at that time were provinces of Russia. Inside Russia, the anti-war sentiment is growing. People are just, they're pissed. They're not, they're not having it. They don't believe in the war. There was a national Irish uprising during this time. We'll see. Uh, there was a lot of problems in Ireland for a long time. This went on for, for years and years. Germany sends 103 ships to destroy the Norwegian merchant shipping ports and industry, but they are met by 51 British warships. And this was a huge turning point. And so this was really big. The British blockade of German uh, forces remained. And, you know, the Germans never came back and, and challenged the, the British in this sense. So uh, they tried it once, it just didn't work, and they never tried it again. Now there's more gas attacks, and many people are thinking, ah, oh, you know, the, the use of science will speed the end of this awful war. But people say, you know what, science is just met by more science. You know, you produce the gas bomb or the gas grenade, I produce the gas mask, and things continue as usual. So that's kind of, I think it just made things even worse. <clears throat> as if they weren't bad enough. The problem with the Austro-Hungarian army was that their soldiers spoke 23 different languages. So it was very difficult. I mean, you had anybody trying to manage that, it was a nightmare. Um, there was the introduction of the tank and it was able to go over barbed wire, you know, which was a big problem for infantry troops uh, and across trenches. So now again, the Russian people protests, they just increase and increase. The generals estimate that there are only enough troops for five more months of fighting. So, you know, they're calculating this. What are you going to be able to do if you're Russia? How are you going to, you know, I mean, not run out of troops, maybe not leave yourself vulnerable to a counterattack. So Woodrow Wilson, he's reelected. He's devised a plan so that there would not remain um, any of these, like, ongoing alliances. That was the problem, right? Post-war is, you know, all the alliances that have been made. So he, he makes the League of Nations. Um, but the belligerents, as they were called, you know, they hated the idea. They didn't like this. They thought it was going to not serve them well. The Russians were growing weak with deaths, with injuries, with desertions, and with strikes. Everyone knew this was the case, especially the Germans. Now, the Russians switched to a defensive strategy. Of course, of course you would do that. And two U.S. vessels are sunk in safe waters. At this point, the U.S. enters the war against the Germans. You're seeing some of the same problems with the French troops. They're beginning to also defect. They're executed for, you know, leaving the army. Americans were very slow to, you know, get into the war. It took about a year before they deployed a significant amount of troops. Uh, Germany sees uh, success with their submarine operations. It's, it seems offensive. Yeah, so it seems that offensive attempts just continue to fail. They just don't, they just don't work. Um, it's very hard to make them be successful. The ability for communications of what has happened on the front lines was not good. Uh, the Bolsheviks had their printing press and phone lines taken down as efforts were uh, to try to persuade workers to strike. So again, the Bolsheviks, they're, they're anti-war. They want to see like an overthrow of the government. You know, Lenin is looking for this overthrow of the government in Russia. And so, but the Bolsheviks, remember they're called the majorities. So that's what that means. Um, they are able to take back some of their communication networks. Lenin declares the current government as deposed. Um, they take the Winter Palace. They take the Kremlin in Moscow. And Lenin was elected the chairman of the Council of the People's Commissars. Lenin declares peace. He prints four million copies and sends them to the troops in the front lines. So he wants, I mean, he's basically saying, I'm taking over. Now there were talks, but people were greedy for lands. In, in uh, conquered in Russia. You know, Wilson issues a peace program. The Germans and the Bolsheviks argue over who would get conquered Russian lands. These areas contained as much as a third of the population of Russia. 
a third of the arable land, which is very important, and 90% of the coal fields, as well as almost all of our oil. So this is what I'm talking about. You know, there was a lot to gain. There was a lot of booty, you would say. I mean, there was a lot at stake, and people were kind of thinking this is why we got into this thing in the first place. They thought that they could win. You know, they thought that they could come out on top. The Germans regained all the ground they had lost on the Somme two years earlier. Lots of American fighters were showing up. Uh, gas shells, blind mini troops. The Germans do take Gun Dunkirk. Germans keep winning, breaking lines, and making it to 10 miles to Paris. So now they're even closer. Corporal Hitler wins uh, the Iron Cross, first class. Uh, the Allied forces, by sheer number, um, overman the Bulgarian forces. The 32 mile uh, Hindenburg line was overrun by the Allies as German defenses began to fail. Hitler was temporar temporarily blinded by a British gas attack. I, you know, who knew that? I didn't know that. So, was blinded by a gas attack. The Habsburg Empire was disintegrating even more quickly than Germany was declining. German troops were mutinying, were, yes, were, you know, defacting, were uh, having a mutiny. The Austro-Hungarian armistice was signed, and all fighting on the Italian front stopped. The Kaiser in Germany, nor his son Max, would rule. It was handed over to a socialist leader, and the Kaiser was exiled to Holland. The Germans signed the armistice, and really, there was about 8.5 million casualties total in World War I. That year, 12 million people would die from influenza, to give you some perspective. I mean, it was awful, but if you want to look globally as far as what are the big things facing humanity or facing, say, development of nations or the prosperity of people, a lot more people die from an, a disease that they don't know how to fight, how to stop, so the flu. And then also more Americans were killed in 1917 and 1918 by car crashes than by war. So I talked about that before, a lot of people dying in automobile accidents. And for whatever reason, people don't want to put any pressure on Ford Motor Company or the big businesses, Dodge at that time or whoever else, you know, in order to make things a little bit more safe for people. Kind of strange. Chapter 4. So the aftermath of Armageddon, we're looking at 1919 to 1925. It says on January 9th, 1919, crowds gather in Berlin, Germany for a revolution, and they flew the red flag. Remember, this is the same red flag, which symbolized the great Soviet Republic. But the Chancellor Friedrich Ebert attacked the revolutionaries with artillery. Kind of sounds like the Arab Spring or, I mean, many other things. But um, the leaders of the revolutionaries were executed along with... Um, 1,200 other people. And I just made a note. It's um, basically that scared governments will kill you. It seems no different from companies. And we'll see that a lot when we look at the um, people's history of the United States. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, hired like armies that some of the companies had in order to stop strikers. So it's something we'll see again and again. Germany installs universal suffrage for men and women under the age of t 20. So Trotsky, I have this question, who is Trotsky? I know I answered that later, so we'll get to it. A couple months into 1919, a, a revolution breaks out in Hungary. It always seems to be the thinkers and the writers that spark a revolution. Revolutionaries want to band together from the Russian Bolsheviks, the Germans, and the Hungarians in Vienna. In Germany, there was a rival government set up. It was the first Bavarian Socialist Republic headed by Ernst Toller. But there was also a second rival government up under Johannes Hoffman, which was also socialist. Now, Lenin is happy, right, as he addresses the crowds in Russia. He's free from exile, and he's in power, and he's in Russia, and um, he's not in some, you know, freezing work camp in Siberia, and he's not in Switzerland. You know, he's telling them that freedom to the working people has arrived in Bavaria and also in Hungary. So, it's pretty interesting. Um, there was a different story in the streets of Munich, though, in Germany. So, um, and Bavaria is like a, a region in modern-day Germany, okay? So, uh, just to help you out. Um, but there was a different story in the streets of Munich in Germany as 35,000 soldiers descended upon the city in order to crush the communist regime. It looks like it was about revenge. It says the Red Guard fighters were killed after being taken prisoners, uh, and treason was a crime. Now, Wilson's League of Nations had mandated territories be given to the victors. France acquired Syria and Lebanon, and that's why um, there's so many French speakers, especially in Lebanon today. Um, <clears throat> things changed for Syria and went a different course, but definitely in Lebanon, a lot of French speakers. Um, 
Britain acquired Iraq and the Palestine area. Um, and so that's why you end up seeing the, eventually a lot of Jews and being let back into Palestine. Uh, although I think it was under the UN mostly that that occurred. Uh, in Eastern Palestine, called the Transjordan, and there was an Arab leader set in office. Britain was pledged to establish a quote-unquote Jewish national home, allowing Jews to congregate there. Also, Japan, New Zealand, and Australia shared Germany's Pacific territories. Um, and also the German properties in Africa were distributed. So Germany lost all of basically the colonies that she had. So Germany lost an important but not a crippling amount of its coal and also its steel production under the ruling of the League of Nations. Uh, the war guilt paragraph in the League of Nations clause, uh, you know, demanded repayment for damages. So they start talking about reparations and things of that nature to ensure that the payments uh, to the allies would occur. The Rhineland and the three bridgeheads to the east um, were like basically held captive for 15 years. So they kept the blockade up until Germany signed the treaty and also Germany had to give up all of their naval warships. So in, in Bulgaria, they, they had to transfer lands. Um, the province of Thrance, uh, her only outlet to the Aegean Sea, uh, to the Allies. So that is, I kind of write, man, they're really screwing, you know, some of these people over. Um, but, I mean, I guess they were maybe threatened or they felt that they were due uh, this kind of repayment. Um, the Allies give this uh, land to Greece in Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia acquires the land uh, in Bul Bulgaria and Macedonia. It says Bulgaria had to give uh, 50,000 tons of coal a year to Yugoslavia and had to dismantle and not rebuild their submarine fleet. They were not allowed to have an air force and only a limited army. Italy acquired a considerable amount of land from Austria. Serbia gained the uh, old areas of the Habsburgs, Slovenia, Croatia, uh, Dalmatia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Czechoslovakia was given the former Austrian province of Bohemia and Morovia. Uh, they also gained Slovakia and Ruthenia. Romania acquires Transylvania and started a vampire factory. Bulgaria announces its annexation from Turkey. So you have the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, basically, the Russian Bolsheviks uh, were synonymous with the Reds. Um, were attacked by the Russian anti-Bolsheviks, known as the Whites. Um, the American and British forces were supporting the anti-Bolsheviks, but they withdrew their support over time. Still, the Whites were strong in number, but divided ideologically. The Whites were defeated, but it was close. Lenin makes a peace treaty with Poland. In India, Gandhi launches a truth force, boycotting British goods, British control waivers in the Punjab, which was... Uh, Today, it's like a major area, agricultural area in Pakistan. But Germany was hamstrung militarily. Hamstrung is when you cut the back tendon of a horse, right? It's crippled for life. So Germany was crippled militarily. They had only a defensive power. Uh, next, to the Poles invade Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. The Reds counterattack, kicking them out of Kiev. Trotsky was the leader of Poland. So there you go, Trotsky. The Red Army had conquered areas of eastern Poland and they cut the Warsaw Danzig Railroad Line, depriving Poland of her outlet to the sea and her main link with Allied supplies. Then the Red Army advances on Warsaw, the capital. The Poles launch a counter, eventually known as the Miracle at Vistula. They had taken 35,000 prisoners in the first week. The Russians retreat. The Green Army of peasants rebelled with Russia, within Russia, so these are like yeah, Green Army, but they're Russian people, peasant people, uprising against the army that uh, is in power in Russia. So Lenin gives orders to kill them. Villages were burned. Another Russian revolt, this time in the Caucasus, led by Muslims in Dagestan and Chechnya. So Dagestan, where the uh, Khabib, Nurmagomedov, you guys know, that follow MMA, he is quite something currently... So he's from Dagestan. Anyway, on October 11th, the Soviet government accepted the Polish armistice terms after Poland had pushed deep into Russian territory and they signed the Treaty of Riga. There were also meetings over the reassignment of lands in Turkey. The Turkish government knew that it had to accept the terms given to it by the Council of Foreign Nations. Turkey was not included in debates. Uh, there was a man, Mustafa Kemal, uh, Kemal 
who led a small army out of Ankara, but he was met by international forces and was defeated. The Turkish peace treaty was signed in Paris on August 10th. The Armenians asked for entry into the League of Nations, but they are denied. Georgia and Azerbaijan were taken under the rule of Russia, and Russia continues to expand. Now, Trotsky, remember he was the leader of Poland, was also the founder of the Red Army. He worked uh, in various military and foreign affairs posts in Russia. Catholics and Protestants were at war in Ireland. The IRA is an army that is important in Ireland. Going back to India, you have Gandhi. He's still doing his nonviolent protest movement. Uh, also, you have the Caliphate movement, which is like the, um, I think it's like the Messiah in, in Islam. The Yeah, it's like a, a prophetic thing. Uh, but it made inroads among the Muslims. So I th think this is related more with Shia Islam, where they're looking for like the, I don't know, the 12th Imam. I'm not sure what all that stuff is exactly, but it has to do with this rule of a, a caliph. Anyway, uh, their name had to do with the Sultan of Turkey, the caliph who was uh, being held by the British. The Muslims said that there should be a ban on serving in the army, so an uprising occurred. They attacked uh, Hindus and Europeans. Hindus refused to convert, uh, were killed to Islam, and the British and the Indian troops stopped this uprising. Uh, the French and the Spanish have similar problems in Morocco, meaning, you know, the people were uprising, um, rioting, etc., etc. In Bavaria, Hitler was building up the second, uh, the National Socialist Workers' Party, the Nazis. He protested against those who signed the Treaty of Versailles and also against Jews. Now, Lenin had uh, to admit that the Russian economy had led to starvation of many and that it was unproductive. He introduced the new economic policy. Trade agreements were signed with outside nations. International aid comes into Russia to help the starving. Now, Northern Ireland becomes part of the UK, while Southern Ireland eventually becomes independent. The KKK, this is in the United States, sees a revival in the Southern states, and um, then comes the Federal Interracial Committee. The Germans are laid on the rep reparation payments, they ask for more time, the amounts were lowered, and stringent tax gathering measures were imposed. So the Allies basically said, fine, we'll give you some more time, but you have to install these certain issues. You see a lot of the same things being done by the IMF today. If, a, say, a country agrees to receive some form of aid or something of that nature, that they have to do so with strings attached, and they have to hit certain limits or certain quotas or install certain you know ways to gather more taxes from the people, yada, yada, yada. In Italy, as many as 200,000 men were fascists military um, supporters. The black shirts were uniforms um, that they wore and they were very intimidating. It says Mussolini declared that violence could be a quote-unquote moral necessity if it was used to resolve what he called a cancerous political situation. The task of fascism was to weld the, nation, the nation into an organic whole that would work for the greatness of Italy, not to destroy the fabric of the state, but to demolish the social democratic superculture. So remember you have Kemal from Turkey. Um, he tried to take some areas. Uh, the British got upset with him, uh, felt their reputation would be tarnished. Uh, Thrance is an area that is controversial. It changes hand often and seems to be desirable. So British had avoided war with Turkey but Kemal becomes the new ruler of Turkey. At this time, Lenin suffers his second stroke during the winter. Uh, he was very aware of the struggle for power after his death that would come, but Trotsky was his chosen successor. He said, Stalin, this guy is too rude. Uh, he didn't have people skills. He was, um, in his opinion, in Lenin's opinion, not the right man for the job. Well, Stalin intercepts the notes from Lenin and he actually hides them for 30 years. No one finds out until way after the fact we find out what Lenin's desires actually were. So tricky, tricky Stalin. I believe, though, that he must have been quite a talented guy. I think he was in uh, work camps six times and escaped six times. So I haven't been... I have been that far north, like to Alaska, to these very frigid areas where it's like man versus nature. To walk out of one of those places, I mean, you know, 
It's no simple task. Hitler takes control of the Bavarian government. Notice how fragmented all of the countries were into sections and areas. He proclaimed a new German government. He took advantage of an economic collapse, which was the cause, uh, which was caused by the French occupation of German areas. They had hyperinflation. Uh, it says the German mark of 1914 had devalued a million million times. by 1923 so nine-year period your money is totally worthless totally worthless the power of Hitler's base was in Munich but he was overcome by police and <clears throat> he was arrested for treason you see so many of these guys these leaders these people that really believe in their cause whether they're right or they're wrong they end up seeing jail time so you could say okay Stalin, like we were talking about, you could say Hitler, like we, we just see here, you know, is imprisoned. Um, but even guys that are celebrated, say, um, say Gandhi, for example, um, we saw that he was imprisoned in uh, South Africa. Also, Nelson Mandela, while we're there, right? I think 26 years in prison, somehow becomes the president. I don't know all the details of that. But basically, I mean, if you want to believe seriously during this time, and maybe it's always been true through history, if you really believe in something that's not popular, you know, you better decide real early on if you're willing to pay the price that uh, prison has often been, uh, often been society's answer for you. In Spain, the Primo de, uh, the Primo de Rivera uh, had a worsening situation in Morocco. There were extremist activities in the Catalan region. So in China, you see anarchy increasing during 1923. Violence was widespread. Dozens of independent armies struggled for food. China decided that the penalty imposed after the Boxer Rebellion at the turn of the century. Oh, yeah, so... It looks like foreign nations decided that they, you know, that they owed some kind of penalty, but the Chinese don't pay. It needed the funds to fight the conflict in the Kuomintang. Um, there's wild inflation in Germany, like we just saw. Um, debt repayment for reparations was obviously a huge problem. Um, France wanted her money from China. Also, many governments owed money to the U.S., including France, Italy, Belgium, and Estonia. Czechoslovakia missed all of the agreed upon payments. Armenia didn't even exist, so it could not pay its debt. Only Britain had attempted to pay back the Americans. 100,000 people die in Tokyo from an earthquake. 1924, Lenin dies at the age of 53. He is succeeded by, sorry you guys, Trotsky, Leon Trotsky. And he was one of the main architects of the revolution of 1970. He was also the founder of the Red Army. <clears throat> Stalin, through political battles, takes rulership of the country. Stalin demolishes all the capitalistic structures that Lenin had tried to establish. So Stalin, okay, so he steals one, he steals the, the leadership. Two, he goes in the total opposite direction, right? I mean, he is like, no way, no how are we having any of this capitalistic stuff. You know, he decided, Stalin decided he was going to go full bore on, on communism. Now, Turkey goes through a massive secularization proce process under Mustafa Kemal, who established the Caliphate. Uh, he rids religious schools, women can vote. He also gets rid of the Arabic letters in exchange for Latin script. Problem is now 80% of the people are illiterate. They can't read, they don't know what, you know, what is this Roman script, Turkish, that he introduced. So this was um, part of the secularization of Turkey. In Italy, the fascists consolidate power. They kill their political enemies. Uh, Matteotti, a gentleman by that name. The French not being able to exact payment from the Germans attempt to find payment by taking raw materials or finished goods by force. This isn't the only time this happens. It happens a lot of other times as well. More problems and more meetings about how to get Germany to pay its reparations in Germany. Hitler awaits trial for treason. The Nazi party had been banned by the Bavarian government. Racism and extremism mixed with nationalism. A Moroccan man declares a holy war against French and Spanish occupiers. The Prime Minister of Spain, the Primo de Riviera, <laughs> makes a line of blockhouses which the Moors never breach. 
Hitler is released from prison. Within two months, the Nazi party is back on. He claimed the party need, needed fighters, not politicians. Some guy named Hindenburg is elected president. Mein Kampf, which is translated My Struggle, was a book that Hitler writ during his time in prison. This thing goes public. A lot of people start reading it. Uh, he also wrote that there were two perils facing the German people. It was one, Marxism, and two, the Jews. He believed that there was a Jewish conspiracy to destroy the Aryan people. Uh, Semitic meant impure. If you've heard that term before, maybe you didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that. So Semitic means impure. And Hitler's views were po unpopular at first. The economy in Germany was improving or stabilizing. Women were participating in public life. We'll see coming up that some of the economic pressures are going to really switch the script, that things are going to change for people, that it's going to be some of the discontent with the living standards that are going to get people to rethink their views on uh, Nazism. But let's uh, take a break and we'll come back for chapter five.